in a dark world filled with deceit. One united voice is crying out. Revealing the truth of God's word. It's time to expose the hidden truth. And unravel the lies. While we're living in Satan's little season. With Sister Crystal and Brother Phil. Welcome to Living in Satan's Little Season show. We're your hosts. Sister Crystal. Brother Phil. Topic today, the Great White Throne Judgment. This is going to be a bombshell of a show. <laughs> And, you know, this may go into actually two shows, actually, because we got a lot to cover here. And before we start, I want to apologize because I have changed my position once again. You know, all the biblical research and everything I'm uncovering when I do my research, I have to go with the data, go with what it says. And I'm going to explain to you about the Great White Throne Judgment, where it fits into the timeline. I've changed my position on where it fits in. On, now, nothing else has really changed that much. No. I, I still think that we're beyond all these events that are in the Bible. We're beyond the Great White Throne Judgment. We're, we're beyond all that. We're waiting to go to New Earth after uh, we endure to the end of this life. Right. Nothing's really changed there. It's just the order of events in the, the biblical events. I've changed the Great White Throne Judgment and put it... Right. Yeah, in a time frame where I think it fits better into the biblical narrative. Well, I really what you're doing is you're correcting the order of events because, again, you're learning, I'm learning. We're, you know, in the process of trying to understand and grow in our faith and obedience to the Lord and seeing where the scriptures line up with the timeline and time frame of things and not taking things out of context and that's the beauty of it, is that we're changing and we're growing and we're being humble. Humility is a vital part of our spiritual growth. And saying, okay, I got it wrong, I'm going to correct it. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit guide me to the right timeline or information that leads through is through scripture and prayer and all that. And, and that's what you've done. Eventually, I'm going to do a show here real, real soon. I'm going to redo my second show on what's the true biblical timeline. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to update it with this new show. So just be aware that I'm, we're going to do a new show on the biblical timeline. But let me explain. Basically, I thought that the Great White Throne Judgment was one of the last things on the biblical narrative. That it happened around 1405 AD. I now have modified that belief now. I think the Great White Throne Judgment happened right around 70 AD now. Mm-hmm. I, I pushed it back. And now, see, after the Great White Throne Judgment is essentially when Christ's millennial reign begins, and that goes a thousand years, and then after that is Satan's little season. Right. Goes in. So essentially, we're on a we're living in a post Satan's little season place. That's that's where we're at on the timeline. Right. That the Satan's little season happened starting about 1070 A.D. Right around in that number. That's when it started, and um, you know he did his thing, and then, of course. They had the Gog Magog War that happened, and then after that, Satan was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, where we're at after that, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Because there's nothing really else that's going to happen other than we endure to the end of our life here in this earth, and then right. we go to the next earth, which has been my position for since I, I changed to my two-earth eschatology. Right. We're essentially the same thing. and There's really no difference that's changed. It's just the order of events have changed in the way I see them biblically. I'm going to explain to you where I got things wrong, why I got them wrong, and why you got to be very careful when you read your Bible. And part of this, again, is a problem with translators and translation problems. This is what I'm discovering, and I'm honestly getting to the point where I believe a lot of this is done on purpose and not just... I'm seeing too many anomalies when it comes to translation work that I think that this is done by design and not... And, and not just, oh, it just happened by accident scenario. And I'm going to explain to you 
why I how I got things wrong. And I think that if you looked at it, you'd be like, oh, I can see why you got that wrong. And then we'll go into that a little bit more. Started to kind of get some clues that the Great White Throne Judgment happened quite a bit earlier than we thought. That it wasn't at the very end of the timeline, but more of like, really in the middle of the timeline, really. Because Revelation talks about the Great White Throne Judgment. That's really the key verse, really. Right. I mean, now it's called the Great White Throne Judgment in Revelation chapter 20. But it, there, it's, refer, it's referenced in other ways in other places around the Bible. Right. And this is why you kind of have to watch out because it's, it's not going to say Great White Throne everywhere. It's just going to say a judgment or whatever. Did a show on the two judgments. A judgment against the nations and then the Great White Throne judgment. Mm -hmm. And essentially there are two judgments just like I stated. Except I thought they were, they were split apart by you know over a thousand years. I realized one is just a judgment against the living, and the other one's a judgment against the dead. And that's really what they are. And they're really right together at the same exact time, almost identical. You know, there's a judgment against the nations, and then right after that, that's a judgment against the, the, those who are alive on the earth at that time. And then there's a judgment against the dead, which is what, what the Great White Throne Judgment And that is. would make sense. Yeah. Judgment against the living, judgment against the dead. Resurrection of the living, resurrection of the dead. Right. You know, everything has an order and, and exactly. it, it, it fits in there just perfect, okay? But I'm just show you where I got things wrong. Now, you just all you have to do is go to Revelation chapter 20. It's really super easy. Now, we're going to read where the Great White Throne Judgment Scripture, the main one, in the Bible, okay? And I'm going to show you other scriptures that back up this scripture about the Great White Throne. Okay, so we're going to go into that first. Can you go ahead and read uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 and 11? The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Okay, so you know you read this and you, you know like okay, well, right after the devil was thrown into the lake of fire was when the great white throne judgment happened. That's you know if you just read that scripture, then this is what the impression you're going to get. You're just going to be like, oh, okay, uh, right after the devil got thrown in the lake of fire forever, then we had the great white throne judgment right after that. Well, <laughs> see, this is why some of these visions don't go in really order a lot of times. Right. And see, because you notice it just says, then I saw a great white throne. It doesn't say, after that, I saw a great white In other words, he, it looks kind of like he might have had a separate vision going back again. And he's done this before. And this is what I discovered in Revelation chapter 19. He did exactly the same mm -hmm. thing. In other words, he kind of gets these different visions and he doesn't put them in chronological order for us always. No. He just gets these different visions and he just, he, he just, spits it out of what he's seeing and we're like thinking oh that must be right after but it's not right after because i can show you we're going to show you some scripture in the bible that kind of indicates this. so it's kind of like he's excited about what he saw and instead of pausing and waiting for the time you know where it falls into place he's just rattling it off like this is what i saw and this is what i saw and this is what i saw almost like he's got add <laughs> well the, in revelation 20 he does go in a certain order right but then he stops doing that, and he just sometimes he just goes into random words. Like for instance, Revelation nineteen verse eleven, it starts out with Christ return. Now before that, it, in verse ten, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. See, so in other words, and he does the same thing there. He goes, now I saw a new vision of the heaven open. It's like in verse eleven. In other words, he kind of starts over again, and he goes back from the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's when Christ was victorious and everything else, and then they were partying down, mm -hmm. right? That was a party that, you know, of course, we weren't part of. That happened way right. back then. But then he, John starts over again in chapter, in, in verse 11 of Revelation 19, and goes into Christ's return in, on, on the great white horse that he has. Mm -hmm. Christ is on a great white horse. God's on a great white throne. Right. <laughs> they right, they, they right, love right. that. They love that white, right? So it starts there, and he goes on. And it does kind of make sense of, on how it goes through everything. And then you have right after, of course, the thousand year, or you get, you get into the millennial reign of Christ. Right. Okay. Because after you have that, when was the, the millennial reign of Christ was, we, we get some impression of when this fits in the timeline. And we're, here's how we get that in the timeline. It says there, then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ right. and the word. Okay. So, you know, 
that the people that were going to reign with Christ were the so ones the that were tribulation. that were the tribulation saints essentially. Right. They were reigning with Christ for the, they would be reigning with Christ for the thousand years. Right. So you kind of know that this couldn't have been earlier than that, because right. you know you you, you had to, that tribulation had to happen. Right. So th see, this is why you have to kind of read these quote timestamps. All of the see, it's nice because well, what we want to do is you know we want to see what happens first, second, third, fourth. We want to know all the order of things. It's not just timestamps, but it's basically like I would say like landmarks, but like <laughs> things that happen in their chronological order of events. And God does, like you said before, God does have chronological orders on how things occur, how things occurred in the Old Testament, how things occur in the New Testament. I think the reason why God doesn't just just lay it right out like I'm laying it out to you is he wants us to read and study his word yep. and figure this stuff out for ourselves. I don't think he just wants cookie cutter, I'm going to give you all the answers right here and just, you know, a simple whatever. Because then we just read the Bible once and then we would forget about it. No, he wants us to research out. He wants us to study it, get excited about his word, and, and try to figure all this stuff out on our own. Well, it also takes faith. You can't just learn these things and go, okay, it's all good. No, sometimes you have to step out in faith and go, okay, I have to believe this because this is the only thing that makes sense. And I think too uh, many people, they want to just be told what to do and not have to believe or put their faith into it. Well, see, so then you have the millennial reign of Christ, which, you know, of course, according to the Bible five times... <laughs> Definitely a thousand years. Right. And then, it's, and then of course, Revelation 20, verse 7 says, Now, when the thousand years have expired. So we know for a fact that the next part of Satan getting released from his prison and going to deceive the nations and the Gog Magog war and all that has to be after the 1,000 years. Because it says there, after the thousand years have expired. So it does give a little bit of some order of things. But then when it gets down to the Great White Throne Judgment, it doesn't say, well, after this, the Great White Throne Judgment happens. He doesn't right. say that. No. He just says, then I saw a Great White Throne. So it's almost like he got a whole separate vision going on. Here, I'm going to explain to you how I started to see hints of where I was kind of messing everything up. Why I kind of messed everything up. But it's easy to get messed up when you're reading your Bible and you, you read something and you go, oh, well, you know, I, I believe what that says. And then you have to do further research to figure out what all that means. And that's right. the problem I'm having. Right. The first thing I looked at is I was trying to figure out where the lake of fire was located. Okay. Because, okay, that shows up in Revelation chapter 19 with the beast and the false prophet first being thrown there. Right. Okay. And we had another, other shows on that. And I'm not, I'm not going to go back to that. But, yeah, as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and read that. Okay. Revelation chapter 19, verses 20 and 21. We'll just read that really quick. And then... I'm going to show you, you know, my train of thought here. I'm going to, well, let's go through there. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, who proceeded, which proceeded from the mouth of him, or sat on the horse. And all the birds... Were filled with their flesh. Okay, so here you have the beast and the false prophet getting thrown in the lake of fire. Well, I got to thinking, I'm like, okay, now where could this lake of fire be? Because we know in Revelation chapter 20, death and Hades actually gets thrown in the lake of fire. Okay, and we're like, okay, so we know that this lake of fire, well, where is it located at? This is where I'm kind of like scratching my head going, well, okay, let me see. If it's here on this world, well, wait a minute now. Then when Satan gets thrown there, he'd mm -hmm. still be in business. I'm like, okay, that doesn't make any so. They would have to be on New Earth, maybe in, where outer darkness is located. And this, okay, this that, that okay, it's in outer darkness. But then I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, wait a minute. So it's just the beast and the false prophet are there by themselves for over a thousand years before everybody before the Great White Throne Judgment happens. Mm. So I'm like scratching my head, going, that kind of doesn't make sense. And that that was a one clue. You know, that was a clue that I had that, okay, there's this place called the Lake of Fire that, you know, at least we know the Beast and the False Prophet were thrown. They're, they're new digs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're a new home away from home. <laughs> I guess you could say. No, it's their, their new uh, crib or whatever, you know? Of course, Satan doesn't, he gets, of course, cast into the abyss for a thousand years, kind of his prison sentence. Right. And then after he's released... After the thousand years is up, he goes out and deceives the nations to go up, to go to war against the campus states of the holy ones, and he doesn't get his due thrown into lake of fire until after that, all that happens. Mm -hmm. Which now I believe it already happened sometime after 
1070 AD, however long it took him to deceive all the nations. We don't really know how much how long how long that was now. Right. I thought it was you know seven uh, four four fourteen oh five AD, but now it could be any time short season, any time after 1070 AD. So, you know, how long that's been, um, you know, obviously we're b- way beyond that now. Right. Um, so Satan is gone now, and now we just have essentially his evil spirits, his, his, his sa- the satanic forces running right. the joint now. Right. Okay. Which, they seem to be doing a pretty bang up job. I'll have, to, I'll have to give them credit for that. They seem to have really corrupted the people really well, and that's what they're doing. Well, whatever they're doing, it's working because people are not following they're, the Lord. Yeah, they're following, they're, they're hook, line, and sneaker. They're falling for the. The sin depravity that we exactly. see going on nowadays. Anyway, let's m- move on to what I'm talking about next. So that was the first clue. Now, there's some other scriptures that came up that I couldn't really explain. It didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. We're going to go over some of those other ones here. Okay, we're going to start in Second Peter chapter 3. Because this is talking about Christ, really, his return. And this is very clear. Now, we're going to go ahead and read that one. Second Peter 3, verse 10. Go ahead and read that one. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Okay, we'll stop there for a second, because obviously he's talking about Christ's return. Right. You know, in this, everyone admits, as a matter of fact, you know, we have a thief in the night. <laughs> if anybody remembers that old movie back in the, right. in the, in the 70s, I think in 1972 it yep, came out. Yep. Thief in the night, before a precursor to the old Left Behind but it series. But it didn't even follow this part of scripture. Yeah, I mean, here you have the thief in the night. What happens after the thief in the night? Well, everything's burned up. <laughs> Wait a minute now. That didn't happen in the movie. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how but, these movies are really not biblically accurate but at they, all. But they'll use a scripture and people will go, oh, I remember that passage of scripture. It must be accurate. No. Just because they have one line or one phrase doesn't necessarily mean it follows scripture to the letter. So you have here the day of the Lord, which is his return. This is his, his second coming, essentially. Okay. So he's coming back. Of course... Then you have the fervent heat events, right? Which is Armageddon, essentially, you know, or I should say, judgment against the nations. That's that part of going on where there's fervent heat, a lot of melted buildings. We, we have a lot of evidence that already happened, and it wasn't the entire world that was destroyed at this time. Right. In another place in Revelation, it only talks about a third of the earth was burned up. Right. So in other words, two thirds survived. I guess it depended on you know where you lived if you got lucky and. Yeah, two-thirds of a chance of surviving, I guess, right. if you lived in an area that wasn't getting this fervent heat going on. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in the holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Here, he mentions here the day of the Lord, and apparently the day of God, same day. You know, okay. Because it, he mentions the same thing, all the fervent heat, you know, the day of God. So the day of the Lord and the day of God, it, it looks like it's just a, they're just synonyms for each okay. other. But you see, that makes sense. Because Christ came and did his work mm-hmm. on that day. And the day of God, of course, is the great white throne judgment day. Right. Okay, so that's judgment day is the day of God. And so, yeah, I think this is really what it's saying here, looking at it from a different perspective now. And it all has to do with looking at things from a different perspective a lot of times. Right, not having a preconceived notion. Yeah, and, and that's why a part of the problem is I'm my own worst enemy when it comes to <laughs> understanding God's Word because I have these ideas in my right, mind of right. how I think things should be. Exactly. And it, it takes an enormous amount of study to get all this programming that I've been programmed with all my life out, you know, and we all are, I think, guilty of this to some extent. But me, I, I you know, just want to apologize because I, you know, I'm not trying to lead anybody astray. I'm trying to get this, these things all right, as biblically accurate as possible. And the main reason why I want it biblically accurate is because I want somebody to say to you, oh, what about this scripture here? And then I'm going to show you a timeline where you that'll fit right in perfectly. Well, I think what happens is we all hear something and we're like, oh, that. That, I'm comfortable with that working out that way. And then because we are should be students of the Word all the time, we read scriptures and then we think, oh, that's not exactly what I thought or what I was ho- you know, thinking, already assuming it was supposed to be. So then we have to go into correction mode. And that's okay because God wants us to get it right, not just to say we like what we got and be done with it. Okay, so let's go ahead and read this. The last verse is a key thing. Because remember, it talks about the day of God, which we know, of course, 
that's God's day is judgment day. Right. Right. So at first it talked about the, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Then it talked about the day of God. Of course, right. God is the Lord, but also Jesus Christ is the Lord too. So it kind of, both of them there, kind of discusses both of them there in this passage of scripture. Now, verse 13 is the key thing. The coming day of God, because the heavens will be dissolved, fervent heat, mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. Now, let's read verse 13. Go ahead. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Okay, and this is why my position is that we're not on that new earth right now. Right. That that new earth, we're on first earth. Right. As as Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 t says. Right. We're on first earth, and then, but yet there's been a new earth created, which, of course, righteousness is running that place. Right. right? So we know we're not there. <laughs> this is more proof you know we're not there, because exactly. is righteousness running this place? No. We're, uh, righteousness isn't running this new earth right now. If we're on new earth, righteousness isn't running, run, right. running this place. No, we, we know wicked and evil people are running this joint. And, uh, and so, like, it's like a prison sentence for us. Yeah. This is just a first thing. It's like, well, man, why would he mention, okay, the Christ's return and then the fervent heat events, which is, of course, the seven bulls, seven seals, seven trumpets and all that, which we know from Revelation, that's what all that one was. And then the day of God and the fervent heat and then go, but we're looking forward to new heaven, new earth. I'm like, well, wait a minute now. Okay. Well, we know all the fervent heat stuff happened back then. Right. So this scripture kind of really kind of got me kind of baffled. Well, maybe, you know, he's delaying the new heaven and new earth for a long, long time. But then that didn't make any sense either because, you know, according to the context of what you're reading, he seems to kind of group it all together as like one main, one huge event. Right. In, in that scripture. I'm just reading it. That was just another clue that I was getting. It's like, okay, well, wait a minute. Maybe this new heaven, new earth coming down. Just like the one where the Beast of the False Potha got thrown into right. a lake of fire, and that happened way back in 70 AD. Well, it sound, kind of sounds like this new heaven, new earth is going to come down right around there, too. Right. Right after the fervent heat events. Right. And that makes sense, because in all understanding it now, that he would need a place for the false prophet and the beast to be, but also... He would need a place for the, isn't the second um, resurrection? Okay, yeah, we have the second resurrection. We have the first and second <laughs> resurrections as well, right, you know? Exactly. So, so, yeah, that all fits in the timeline because the first resurrection happened right when Christ returned. Right. You know, that were, and people were caught up with Christ right. in the air and they landed on the Mount of Olives. That was the right. first resurrection, right? And then, of course, we have the second resurrection, I believe, happened after Armageddon happens and then the. Uh, Judging of the nations right. with the seven seals, seven bulls, seven trumpets. Right. After all that happens is when you get what is known as the great white throne judgment. Right. Which is the, the second resurrection. And, you know, however long well, that's that... the wicked and the dead. Yeah. And everybody right. gets resurrected right. there. Right. Both the righteous and, and the, the wicked. wicked. Right. 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 And, and there's more scripture here we're going to go over. We're just reading the, the few of them that have got me like thinking, okay, well, wait a minute now. Now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 13. Okay, and there's some parables of the wheat and the tares. Right. In 13. Now, this is an important one because this gives us an indication. And I always look, I always look at these timestamps. Mm -hmm. See, one thing I'm, I'm now doing now, I'm looking for timestamps on when these things are going to occur according to my Bible. Okay. This is kind of helpful in how I'm getting a timeline going that seems to be a working timeline. So, I'll go ahead and read Matthew chapter 13. Verses 40 through 42. And we're going to go ahead and read this one here next. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Okay, so Jesus is talking about the end of the age. Now, I haven't really gone into this in a, a previous show, but I might as well go into it now. Jesus talks about these ages. Okay, there's, or, or what they know as forever. So they're not really forever, they're ages. You know, there's known as this age. When the Bible says this age, he's meaning, okay, Whoever the audience they were talking to at this time, that was their age. So in other words, Jesus would say, in this age or the age to come. See, we're living in the age to come. <laughs> that's that's our age right now. But the people that are that the Bible, the New Testament was written to, that was this age. So every time you see the word this age, this isn't referring to the age we're living in, folks. Right. Because we're living in the next age. Okay. Okay. Jesus is talking about this age, which was the age that they were living on, and it was about ready to come to an end, because at 70 AD, everything was going to be over on the old covenant system, and then there was going to be a new age usher in. Right. Oh, it was known as a new, that's why we have the New Testament. The New mm -hmm. Testament 
ushered in the new age. Right. Okay. But it says he so he talks about this age. So when he says the terrors will be gathered and burned in the fire, so it'll be at the end of this age. Mm. So what Jesus was saying here was that there's going to be a basically a, re, a, a harvest going on right at the end of this age, age that he was talking to. He was talking to his audience here, right? And the age that they were talking to, right? Okay, so I'm trying to get us to understand this because there, there's some other scriptures that kind of go into all this stuff, but we'll go ahead and. Let's go ahead and t- continue on in verse 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Okay, and we know what, what that was. That was Jesus coming with the holy angels. Mm-hmm. And that was seven seals, seven bulls, seven trumpets in the Revelation all talks about, okay? Right. And with the great fervent heat and vents and all that. Other, that's what this is. It's the gathering out of, in other words, a, a judgment against the nations, judgment against the living. Right. That was their job. <laughs> their job was to pound all the living to a, a pulp, essentially, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, of course, judge some areas more harsh than others. Well, it consequences for behavior and actions. In other words, all things that offend. In other words, they were going to ram the areas that are the offensive areas of the world and keep the other ones fine. Right. So that's kind of the area, kind of what they did. All right, and... We'll cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be a wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, we know that the wailing and gnashing of teeth event, which is the weeping and gnashing of teeth, other right. versions say, that they're all pretty much the same event, is you know, those people who are of the, the, the second resurrection. Right. Okay, that happens, the great resurrection happens, and then there's people will be cast into outer darkness as a judgment, right. where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right. So this, I, I, I think, is really describing the... Judging of the nations, and of course the dead get judged. Right. And, he, and then of course, at the resurrection, we know that the wicked will be resurrected as well. Right. And they'll be cast into outer darkness. Mm-hmm. We'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth in basically lake, also called the lake of fire. Right. So there's like this lake of fire, um, outer darkness area, and it, that's kind of how it describes here the furnace of fire. You know? Right. 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 Okay. So. Again, you know, th- th- this just indicates, it just seems like, okay, this is a, all of these judgments are about, kind of sounding the same. You know, like the living judgment against the living, which is, you see in Revelation. And then you have the judgment against the dead, which you, you find in Revelation as well. And that happens right after. Right. So, it, and then of course, the judgment against the dead is all of us. It, when we, when we die, we essentially go to judgment and we get judged by the Lord at that point. Now we're going to go to, cause there's, there's some, a lot of other ones. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13 and we're going to continue on here because I'm going to drive this point home uh-huh. to where you'll know for a fact that, okay, yeah, I there'll see what you're no talking doubt. about. I'm going to try to get where there'll be no doubt in your mind. This is right. going to be a long show and we'll even have to go to two shows on right. this one. Okay. Matthew well, chapter 13. You want to be concise and sharing all this because you don't want anyone to have any doubts or fogginess as to what you're discussing. Yeah, and I'm trying to get you to understand, okay, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm trying to get you to follow my train of thought here. Right. I'm reading these scriptures, and I'm trying to put time stamps on things, where they might have fit in on the timeline, and so that when other people bring these scriptures up to you, other believers, other people with denominations, you can go, oh, okay, yeah, that fits right in here. Right. This is what I'm really wanting to have everybody do. And it's taken me a while to, to reverse engineer all this stuff because of my preconceived ideas and a few translation problems. Okay. Right, right, right. Matthew chapter 13. Okay, go ahead and read that one, starting with verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so just like the last one, Mm -hmm. um, the end of the age, and we know when the end of the age was. End of the age was the end of the age that they were talking about there. Right. That was 70 AD. (laughs) That's when the angels did their work. And maybe they were involved with the Great White Throne Judgment, it kind of sounds like. Because mm-hmm. that's is exactly what, what, what was going on here. Where they'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Well, we know that that was the people that were cast in outer darkness. Right, right, right. Just like when people died today, or back in the biblical times. Right. Okay, the, the, the angels, one part of the angels' jobs was to take their souls. Escort the, them. Escort them to Hades. Right. 
Now it sounds like we're getting a little more information. That also, when it came comes to, to these great white throne judgment, mm. that these angels were involved with um, separating the wicked from among the just. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So I'm just you know pointing out a few things here. The angels did had quite a few jobs here, and that's what kind of what they did. Of course, and they'll cast them into the fiery furnace, which furnace of fire. We know that's the same thing as a, as a what. Uh, lake of fire. Lake of fire. Right. Lake of, uh, if lake of fire, furnace of fire, seems like it's talking about the same thing. Exactly. And, it, you know, that's obviously a reference to the same exact place. Right. Called different things, but obviously same same exact thing. Now let's right. go on to the next one. Matthew chapter 25. Okay. Now this one gives us a really, really good time stamp here. Now this is why I was like, this one got me like really thinking. This is when he's talking about separating the sheep from the ghosts. Okay, Go Matthew ahead. 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, when he will sit on the throne of his glory. Okay, well, we'll stop there for a second, because we know when that exactly, from a lot of other passages, and I've gone over a lot of when Christ comes with the holy angels. I mean, we all know that's the second coming of Christ. Right. right. Now. Okay, so there's no doubt in your mind, the only time Christ is coming with the holy angels was at his second coming. So here, it's obvious time stamp here on this passage of scripture. This is the second coming of Christ. Mm. He's coming with his holy angels, just like it said in Revelation chapter 19. Same thing. He's coming right. with his holy angels, his holy entourage, and they're going to come kick butt. So in other words, he, he's coming with a reinforcements. Right. Fight. Right? Right. Okay. So I wanted to bring that up because we know the time stamp here is given on this one. Son of Man, Christ, coming with the holy angels. It's, it's for judgment against the nations. That's, you know, the great white throne judgment, or the judgment against the nations coming up, you know. Right. When he comes back, and of course, the dead in Christ will rise and be, be with Christ. Exactly. He'll become part of that angelic entourage. Right. That, that's how what happens then. Okay. From other passages of Scripture. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Okay, see, when it says all the nations, okay, that word nations is is really the same word as Gentiles. Okay. Okay. So in other words, it's all the Gentile, just all the peoples. It, okay. it just, in other words, it's just saying all the peoples of the earth. Okay. okay? It, it, it's kind of confusing when you say nations, because when we think of nations, we think of, oh, a, a nation state. Like right. United States, um, UK, Canada, Australia. We think of that as being a nation. No, no, right. that's not what he's talking about here. The nation is like the peoples. Right. The generally they, they typically meant non-Jewish people, but just right. just people in general, the peoples in general. Okay, right. this is kind of what the nations are talking about in the Bible. So right. it kind of can be confusing. But here, obviously, they're all going to be gathered together, and he's going to separate them one from another as a shepherd divides a sheep from the goats. Right. So in other words, there's a separating going on here. Okay, gonna and of course he's explaining. What's going to happen at the end of the... Again, we know when the end of the age is... 70 AD was the end right, of the age, right? right. So, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Separates the sheep from the goats. So in other words, he's separating them both. Now, if you, I'm not going to read the whole passage of scripture in there, but it kind of continues on, explains how he separated people that were the sheep and the people that were the goats. And mm-hmm. you can go ahead and read that one if you want to. It's their, essentially their behavior. Right. It's their lifestyle they were living. The choices they made. The choices they were making in their lives. Mm-hmm. They were, how loving they were to their neighbor, how caring they were to others, that kind of thing. Okay. And you can go ahead and read the rest of that. Now, the end of that parable, he gives punishment and a reward for these. So go ahead and read Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. We know when Christ came in his glory with the holy angels, this shows up. Wait a minute, there's a big judgment that happened? Mm-hmm. But we know, according to Revelation, that this judgment that was going to be against the nations was essentially affected the dead. Right. Because we know, see, that's why every one of these passages of Scripture gives us a little bit different detail on these certain things. Right, right. You know, not all of them are going to give you all the details. That's why you kind of have to combine them together and go, okay, I'm seeing how this all works. See, Jesus, when he came, he he ushered in 
the judgment against the nations, which was the living and the dead. So right. the, the living was the people that were the angels were going to judge and you know put all these all these things down on the whole earth. Right. Seven bulls, seven seals, seven trumpets, all that, all that stuff, which all happened back then. Right. And then, of course, we also have a separating of the sheep and the goats right. going on. Right. Which that's a great white throne judgment. Right. That happened essentially. It look, kind of sounds like it, it's near the same at the same time. It right. all kind of happened simultaneously. Right. Because one group was put into everlasting punishment. Right. And the other group was sent into everlasting life. Right. And so we know when the everlasting life shows up, it's at a resurrection. Right. So, again, this is just another little bit of evidence that, okay, now it seems like what Christ was saying, because we know that the wicked didn't get resurrected until the great white throne judgment. Right. It was only that the first resurrection was only, only for, for the righteous, the righteous, the dead in Christ. Christ right. Yeah, we had the shows on that. We kind of explained all that here. The dead in Christ was for the first resurrection. Right. Now, the second resurrection was for everyone. It's a general resurrection of the dead. Well, here he claims that, look at, they're going to separate sheep from the goats, and one one person's going to be resurrected to eternal life, mm-hmm. and the other one's to eternal punishment. This is obviously, with a time stamp given, explaining that, yeah, when he returned, that's when the great white throne judgment occurred as well. Right. Not only pounding away at the people that were alive on earth at the time, but also the dead as well got judged. Right. See, that's why every one of these passages of Scripture gives you a little bit different detail, and you have to kind of put them all together, and that's what I'm kind of doing. Well, really what it is, is you're taking different pieces throughout Scripture, and you're putting the puzzle together. And that's really what I think God really designed, because he wants us to love his word. He wants us to feast on his word daily. But what you're doing is you are taking the pieces of, I guess you could say, clues, that are found in scripture Mm -hmm. and you're piecing them together and you're seeing this picture that, I mean, that's kind of, that sounds like how God would work. He wants you to, he doesn't want to just hand it to you so you don't have to do any work for it. He wants you to look, seek and find. And that takes time. It takes maturity. It takes discipline and it takes humility because you read a piece before you get another piece in place and you get them out and it doesn't fit right. And then you're like, okay, I got to re, I got to go back and take this one out of there and put this, you know, and that's really what you're doing. But that also takes time in your development, in your faith. Like I say, we got more that I'm going to go into here. I'm going to give you a, just one more quick passage of scripture before I, I get to like my final thoughts here on this. And then we'll have to do another show next week. On a little bit more on this because I have way more that I, I hadn't gotten to. Right. Because I knew this would be a long show. Okay, now we're going to go into th- this idea of the this age that they were living or the time that they were living in then and then the age to come, which is, I'm actually thinking that we're living in the age to come. Mm-hmm. Okay, because Christ was in was talking to the people in that age. And then, of course, the age to come was after the, when, the, when the new covenant showed up and everything else. And that was right. kind of the age to come. Okay. And this is very clear in scripture. I mean, normally there's been ages throughout scripture. And the biggest age was okay, the, going from the old covenant system mm-hmm. to the new covenant system. Right. And this is, we're living in the new covenant system, which was, it's called in the Bible, the age to come. Let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 18, verse 29. To 30. Go ahead and read that one. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Okay, so here he was declaring actually that the age to come would be the age that you would get eternal life. Mm. See, he was talking to the people at this, he was our time right here. You know, we're not really in the age to come yet, you know, but the eternal life is going to get dished out mm-hmm. in the age to come. Right. That's essentially what he was saying here. This is the point you, you, you start reading all this. And I'm like, okay, this is making, a, making a whole lot more sense. This age to come was, is basically the time where eternal life was going to get dished out there. Right. I, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, oh, wait a minute, brother Phil, I, <laughs> I, I got, I got a scripture for you. I got a verse Because for you. this, you know, and of course, we're going to go to 
Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. Okay. Because this is the scripture that was tripping me up. Because it d- does appear there's a st- time stamp given mm-hmm. about when the general resurrection, when, or when the great white throne judgment was going to happen. Okay. And that's found in Revelation 20, verse 5, in our Bibles. And we're going to turn there really quick. Because if you read that, you'd be like, see, Brother Phil, you know, you're wrong. See, it's <laughs> everyone is going to get their judgment after Christ's millennial reign. It stays right there. Now, let's go ahead and read Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 here. And this is what I'm going to finish off of, is this, this, this idea, this scripture here, and I'm going to show you what's going on here. But the rest of the dead did not re- live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. You know, you, you read Revelation chapter 20, and I, I, I don't want to go into the whole thing right now. But Revelation chapter 20, for, for sure, after the thousand years, they would live and reign, the, the, the holy saints would live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then it says here, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Well, right. see, that's proof there that, see, and this is what this is what was tripping me up. I'm like, right. no, that means that the general resurrection did not couldn't have happened until after the thousand years was over. Obviously, according to that scripture, the rest of the dead, which would be all the wicked dead right. and everybody else, weren't going to live again or weren't going to get resurrected again until the thousand years was finished. Right. And so by reading that, you're all like, well, see, that's pretty clear. That means that it, the great right throne judgment had to happen after the thousand year reign of Christ. It's the only thing that makes sense, right? Well, that's what I thought until I did more research and found out. Uh-oh. Yeah, this is where you can't always trust your Bible translators, folks. Okay? Because I was reading this passage of Scripture, and for one thing, it doesn't really fit in with the flow of what's happening here in this passage uh-huh. of Scripture. Okay? Now, let me let me read it without the thousand years. Because it says, I saw the souls of them who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus Christ. This is the verse before. Okay. And for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, or ha- received the mark in their forehead or hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. See, okay. this that, that kind of makes sense. Okay, wait a minute. That they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, and those people that were part of that, didn't, they, they didn't get beheaded for, uh-huh. for the, got beheaded for the sake of Christ and all that. They were part of the first resurrection. Right. But then, but then if you read it with that, it says, they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection? Uh-huh. Wait a minute. Why This phrase in there doesn't make sense on the Thank flow right, right, right. of the passage of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Well, I did a little more research, and I, I discovered that it was kind of confusing because I was reading a, a, a number of other versions of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Okay. And some of them would have this area, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand words were finished in parentheses. Okay. They, put, they, they would put brackets around that part in their Bible. Right, right. And I thought to myself when I read some of these versions, I'm like, why would they put a bracket around that? Right. That doesn't make any sense. And some of these versions, I kind of looked it up as many versions as I could, you know, before I did the show. And this includes the NIV has brackets around it. Okay. The, that's the New International Version. The New Living Version has right. brackets around it. Okay. The... New Revised Standard Version has brackets around it. And I even okay. looked it up in my New Revised Standard Version. I had, yep, it had brackets around it there. Uh-huh. The Lexicon English Bible has brackets around it. New Century Version has br- brackets around it. The New English Translation has brackets around okay. it. Okay. The Complete Jewish Bible has brackets around it. 20th Century New Testament has bra- brackets around it. And so on. There's a couple other more, uh, uh, other ones right. as well. Okay. Point is, is there's a number of these ones that have brackets around it. And I thought to myself... Oh, that's what interesting. Are brackets for? Yeah, why do they put brackets around it? And then I found, okay, I found another translation, right. one of my Septuagint translations that they they go over all these quote disputed texts in the Bible. Right. All these texts that were that according to the evidence got kind of thrown in there mm-hmm. um, by some scribe somewhere. Right. And so this is a disputed text, and apparently the earliest, most Reliable manuscripts we have mm. do not contain this phrase. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Mm. See, that sh- essentially was an add-on by a later on, a, apparently a later on maybe, z- zealous scribe. Maybe a scribe who was getting paid under the table. 
Well, I've seen so many of these anomalies yeah. now that I'm really beginning to think that this was a concerted effort to corrupt our Bibles. Well, yeah, so there so, were others. I know there was other passages, at least a couple more that you and I have talked about, and not on the air, but just personally, that, is a, oh, that, that one is, is a disputed text. And I didn't know that. But there, you know, some people might be aware of some of those. But it's interesting that we come across these that don't. And you came across another one. They're like, oh, this doesn't, this isn't right. You know, this, this doesn't make sense. So we, that like that red flag should go off. Well, there's a number. There's a lot of disputed texts, and, and most of the time, it's usually an add-on. They rarely ever subtract something from the Bible. Right. Usually, right. what happens is it's usually something's been added. Right. It's like some. Um, scribe goes, I need to clarify this uh, phrase a little bit more. I'm going to add in a little bit. I'm going to indulge here. Yeah. And this is what happens. Okay. Mm. And But we can usually find out because these copyists can look at other copies and go, oh, wait a minute now. These copies are all matching up. And there's a lot of disputed texts in the Bible. I mean, some of the bigger ones are like the whole, basically, last chapter of Mark, Mark 16, mm -hmm. verses 9 through 20. Right. Is one of the largest ones in the Bible. And that's all been added in. Right. Okay. The original text did not con the earliest manuscripts did not contain any of that stuff. Mm. So all the, basically the Mark should go all the way to verse eight on Mark chapter sixteen, and everything from nine all the way to to verse twenty mm. is all just add on. Wow. Yeah, it's not in the original text. Wow. And another one is John ch ch uh, chapter eight verse one with the woman caught in adultery. That right. story. Okay. That's that's. John 8, 1 through 11. That wow. whole story with, with the woman caught in adultery that, you know, you hear about. And, you know, you, you, we, everybody again knows that this story that's been in the church any amount of time. Well, right. it really was just an add-on. It really wasn't doesn't appear to be in the original text. Mm. Because the earliest manuscripts don't have that phrase. Mm -hmm. And, unfortunately, there's other sad parts that have been added in, too. Basically, the two biggest areas that talk about the Trinity. <laughs> and yeah. this have been added in. Where we get this doctrine of the Trinity, we use a couple of passages of Scripture, and both of them are not are not in the original. See, it's like these people wanted to push down some kind of doctrine, and by they, they add in all this stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. like Matthew chapter twenty eight verse nineteen, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, there's the Trinity right. right there. Woo! We got the <laughs> Trinity right there in the baptism. Well, you find out that phrase there. Uh huh. The earliest manuscripts don't have that phrase. Anymore. Okay, it's not in the original. Well, maybe and, that maybe yeah. that scribe wanted to like you know give everyone their credit. Well, <laughs> you know, and of course you have you know in First John five seven and eight is another one that's really famous about the Trinity. That one also a, a major mm. add on. It's like they were pushing you know they had this oh we got to push this doctrine of the Trinity so we might add this into our early Bibles and whatnot when it's not necessary. You know, this teaching of God and Christ being one, you know, unified. You don't, they don't need to force feed all this, but this is kind of what happens Well, we kind of times. know they're unified, but... The whole point is that there's a lot of these disputed texts out there. Uh-huh. And this one right here is a huge one. <laughs> but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Isn't in the earliest manuscripts. Right. And it sounds much more flowing without that phrase in it. Right. So, in other words, that one text that seems to indicate, oh, it looks like the Great White Throne Judgment wasn't until after the thousand-year reign of Christ. Well, it turns out that it shouldn't have been in our Bibles to begin with. Right. That wasn't what the author was saying. Again, this threw me off because in your mind you're thinking, well, we know exactly when the rest of the dead live again. Right. After the thousand years is up. But then you have to do some more research and find out, well, that isn't really in the original text. Mm. So it means that it was... An opinion. I think it was a satanic deception, honestly. Mm. I think some of these mistakes, it's hard to believe that they were just thrown in there nilly-willy by accidentally. Uh -huh. I just find this to be too convenient. To th and so this threw, throws everybody off. Oh, the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years was up. Right. When I'm really thinking that if without that, yeah, you don't get it, you don't have a timestamp of when the Great White Throne Judgment happens. And you have to use these other passages of Scripture to do. Well, I find it really interesting that those things exist because... There are no mistakes with God. So maybe he allowed that interference so that Christians and his followers would be seeking and would be able to see a flaw. It's kind of like when someone writes a book and they have editors and people that read their work to kind of like edit what they do. 
It's kind of like we are the chief editors of God's Word, and we can see the flaws in it and go, okay, that's not right, or that, that doesn't make sense, and that must be an add-in of someone's thought or you know, clarifying what they think is right, not what God's Holy Spirit says is right. Yeah, of course, this passage in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, would also conflict with these other ones we just read mm-hmm. about how, no, everyone's going to get judged at the end of that age, and not after the thousand years is up, because that's way, that's well, that's well into the next age. Because <coughs> the thousand year reign of Christ is the beginning of the next age. Right. And matter of fact, we could be in the third age, because it could be the second age was the, the thousand year reign of Christ, and then the now we're in the essentially the third age of mankind since mm. since that time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you can it depends on how you do ages, but we're definitely in the what's known as the age to come, right? Not in the the age that the, that Christ was talking about there. So I, honestly, knowing what I know now and understanding now, I'm really thinking the Great White Throne Judgment occurred right after the judgment against the nations. Mm-hmm. That you know the seven bulls, seven seals, seven trumpets. Right after that. And next week, we'll go into some more evidence. Well, that would make the most sense, honestly, because if he's going to do one, he's going to do them both. And, of course, this you know, there's a lot of other passages, even in the Old Testament now, that weren't making sense. And now, with all this, okay, wait a minute, all these make sense now. <laughs> okay, they all make sense now, but you have to read them all. Everything. Under- yeah. But you blows. see, this is why these Bible translators, none of them have left it out of their Bibles. But there's only one... <laughs> Get this, there's only one translation that was honest enough to say, okay, this is a disputed text, and we're not going to put this in our translation. Mm. All the other ones just throw it in there like, oh, that, that was the original in, in, in the original Bible. Like they don't, and they, they, they don't, include, t- no and they don't tell anyone. you that, no, no, it looks like the most earliest manuscripts, I mean, earliest Greek manuscript doesn't have this. Mm. Okay. The earliest Aramaic manuscript doesn't have this. Okay. okay. This is a good sign this wasn't really in there to begin with. Okay. Plus, it doesn't flow right with the text, and there's a bunch of other problems with it. Almost certainly this, and plus, it doesn't vibe according to these other passages we read. Right. About when the rest of the dead were going to live again. Right. Because it seemed to me like we just read, when Christ comes, he was going to separate the sheep from the goats, and one was going to get everlasting life, and the other one, so you see, again, the dead were all going to be judged at that. You know, I, well, I'm just trying to, to put this out there, because we're living in a very dark, deceptive age. We must be vigilant. We must be manly. We must be fortified, standing firm in the faith, doing everything out of love, not only because it's biblical. Because it glorifies God. Join or contact us at satanslowseason.org. This is a non-copyright, living in Satan's little season production.